All right, just thought I'd do a video refuting the non-dispensational heresies of Jack Smack 77, and also just showing his complete ignorance of what hyperdispensationalism is. Okay, I want to first point out that I reject hyperdispensationalism. Okay, hyperdispensationalism is a heresy. And I'm going to show you what hyperdispensationalism is and how Jack Smack 77 is completely ignorant of what actual hyperdispensationalism is. Okay, all these non-dispensational heretics, and I call them heretics because they're teaching non-dispensationalism is a very satanic heresy. Um, all of them have no idea of what a hyper. Oh, not, I shouldn't say all of them. Most of them that I've talked to. Well, pretty much all the ones that I've talked to, okay? Maybe not all maybe not all non-dispensationalists in the world, but all the ones I've talked to have no idea of what a hyper-dispensationalist is when they go around calling, oh, you're a hyper-dispensationalist, okay? Here's what you do. Whenever someone calls you a hyper-dispensationalist, if you believe in the scriptural doctrine of dispensational salvation, just simply ask them, okay, what is hyper-dispensationalism? Define it for me, okay? And oftentimes what they'll say is that, well, you believe people are saved differently throughout the Bible. Um, that's not what hyperdispensationalism is. Okay, I'm going to show you in a minute what actual hyperdispensationalism is and how this little liar Jack Smack Seven Seven is completely ignorant and also a novice too. Because if you think that that people are saved the same way throughout the entire Bible, you're a novice, plain and simple. You don't know the Bible. You don't know the Word of God. And let me point this out too. One of the biggest lies and deceptions today is that, well, true dispensationalism has always taught that salvation is the same in every dispensation. That's that's a lie, okay? Salvation being the same in every dispensation is not true dispensationalism. It's a false perversion of, the, of dispensationalism. So people who say that salvation is the, is by faith, grace through faith alone in every dispensation, uh, they're, they're teaching a false Form of they're not they're not teaching. I'll put it this way: they're not teaching true dispensationalism. But I'm gonna show you this video. Um, typical, just Jack Smack Seven Seven going on a little childish rant, uh, as usual. So I'm gonna show you this. Hyper dispensationalism is straight out of hell. Let's open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 115 reads: Not unto us, O Lord. Not unto us, but unto thy name, give glory for thy mercy, and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Now, hyper-dispensationalism is a bunch of stupidity. It's a bunch of garbage. It's basically this idea that we're saved by grace in this dispensation of grace, and that people of the Old Testament, and likewise future saints, in the ages to come, like, for instance, the tribulation or the millennial kingdom, these people were saved by grace plus works. Eh, wrong. That's not what hyperdispensationalism is. He just showed his ignorance, okay? Uh, I did a video on this a while back, a couple months back, but just simply go on Google. This is very simple. Just go on Wikipedia and look up hyperdispensationalism. Go down to the section of general views, near the bottom of that section, this is what a high, this is what an actual hyperdispensationalist believes, okay? And I'm going to show you that this is false doctrine. Uh, hyperdispensationalism are not monolithic or homogenous. There are two main positions, as well as a few other minor variations. The two main positions are Acts 9 and Acts 13. What is Acts 9 and Acts 13? Well, Acts chapter 9 is where the Apostle Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, and Acts chapter 13 is where Paul was ordained into the ministry, okay? But continuing, the difference are mi differences are minor, being only technical. They all see the dispensation of grace, which is the church age, as beginning with the Apostle Paul. Also within the movement is found the King James only elements associated with many teachings of Richard Jordan, Grace School of the Bible. While act the Acts 2 position tries to distance itself from its more consistent dispensational brothers, as well as ultra dispensationalism, which basically saying the church age, the, the dispensation of grace, basically. Uh, which, you know, it's not a real term, obviously. Uh, the the term I like to use is the time of the Gentiles. That's, that's my preferred term. But this thing of ultra-dispensationalism, they even take it a step further. They say that the church begins after Acts chapter 28. Uh, they are all true dispensationalists and fully evangelical, leading towards fundamentalism. No, they're not. They're not true dispensationalists. Furthermore, the differences separating mid-Acts position from the Acts 28 position are just as great as those separating the Acts 2 position, kind of like the baptismal regeneration heretics, from its more consistent mid-Acts dispensational brothers. Okay, what is a hyper-dispensationalist? A hyper-dispensationalist is someone who says that there's basically the church age, the, the dispensation of grace did not begin till the Apostle Paul. 
Okay, and and one of the things we'll try to say is that there's nobody in Christ before the Apostle Paul. Okay, that's what a hyper dispensationalist dispensationalist is. A hyper dispensationalist is not someone who says that salvation is different in different dispensations. So Jack Smack just showed his ignorance. Okay, a hyper dispensationalist is someone who basically would say that there's there's two bodies to Christ. There's there is the the body for the Jews with with Peter, and then the body for the Gentiles of Paul. And there's nobody in Christ before Paul. That is heresy. And I'm going to give you two really good scriptures to refute this this heresy, this hyper dispensational heresy that there's no uh, there's nobody in Christ before Paul. Uh, and and yeah, they still say other ridiculous things too. Like they'll say let, let, like oftentimes they'll actually go through the Pauline epistles and pick and like, rip things out of Paul. Like one of the things, um, for example, the the Ed Fenninger called the Ed Fenninger crew, uh, they're hyper-dispensationalists because they're just, they're taking Romans chapters 9 through 11 and saying that those are actually for the tribulation and the time of Jacob trouble, not for Christians today. So a hyper-dispensationalist is someone who just cuts up the Bible, cuts up the epistles, and, you know, they'll even cut up the Pauline epistles and say certain parts of the Pauline epistles are not for Christians. Uh, that's what a hyper-dispensationalist is. So, for example, again, my example, Ed Fenninger. Uh, and his little crew, they're hyper dispensationalists. They they take Romans ten, Romans chapters nine through eleven, and try to say those are not for Christians today, but the rest of the chapters in Romans are for Christians. That's that's a good example of what a hyper dispensationalist does. But two really good scriptures to refute um, hyper dispensationalism: Romans sixteen seven, salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are not among the apostles, who also were look at this in Christ before me. So. If you're going to go around saying there's nobody in Christ before Paul, what do you do with this? Paul says there were, these people were in Christ before he was. Uh, it's Romans 16, 7, another really good quick little scripture to refute hyper dispensationalism. Acts chapter 5, verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. So when you're added to the Lord, what do you think that means? You're in Christ. How, do, how can you be added to the Lord and not be in Christ? Obviously. So Acts 5.14, they're added to the Lord. So they're in Christ. And this is before Acts chapter 9, when Paul became an apostle. So yeah, Romans 16.7 and Acts 5.14. Some really good quick little proof texts to refute hyper dispensationalism, proving that there were people in Christ before Paul. So again, Jack Smack just displayed his complete ignorance of what a hyper dispensationalist is. Okay? Again, hyper dispensationalist is not someone who believes the biblical doctrine that there's Salvation is different in different dispensations. A hyper dispensationalist is someone who says, uh, "Sorry about that. Get my mic. Oh, sorry about that. Probably was really loud." Um, a hyper dispensationalist is someone who says that there's nobody in Christ before, before Paul, and that basically the church age, the dispensation of grace, did not begin until Acts chapter nine or Acts chapter thirteen, or some will even say until Acts twenty-eight. Okay, that's false. The church age, the dispensation of grace, the time of the Gentiles, began after the death of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's just the gospel was not fully revealed until Paul. That's the big difference. But, going to continue. Or faith plus works. And that their salvation is based on an elemental mixture of the two, instead of just being grace alone. And the reason why this is so stupid um, is... Yeah, it is grace alone in every dispensation. God's grace has to be there. But grace is not the plan of salvation. You see what he did there? He'll say that, see, it's heresy to say salvation is by faith and works. See, it's always by grace alone. Well, that's true. God's grace is always there. It's always by God's grace. But grace is not, not the plan of salvation. See, these, guys, these heretics always do that. Because, number one, the gospel was preached in the Old Testament, and the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, no, the gospel was preached in the Old Testament. So then why did Jesus Christ come and die on the cross then? If they're already being saved by that method, what was the point of him even coming down the cross? Okay, and and again, his heretics always do that. They'll say oh, they were saved by the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Okay, I mean that, that just it's just laughable. I mean, really, if you're gonna believe that, you just have to make a complete mess of the scriptures. Uh, Luke chapter nine. Uh, where is it? Beginning at I think it's yeah, I think it's yeah, verse twenty one. Sorry, not verse twenty one. It is yeah, verse. Uh, Sorry, Luke chapter 9, verse 43. Sorry, I'm going to give you two good scriptures to refute this lie that they're saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 43. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God, but while they wondered, everyone at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, 
So look what he's going to say. Verse 44, let these things sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. So he's foretelling what's going to happen to him on the cross. But look at what happens. Look at, look at their response. Verse 45, but they understood not they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them that they perceived it not, and they fear and they feared to ask him of that saying. They didn't understand what he was saying. So if it's a if it was basically they're always being saved by the death, burial, and resurrection, or they're looking forward to the cross, then why is it that they have no idea what he's saying? They didn't understand it. They were not being saved by looking forward to the cross. Another good scripture to prove that, to further prove that. Acts, or sorry, Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse, uh, yeah, verse 31. Uh, Acts, Acts 8, sorry, not Acts, Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, so he's, he's again going to foretell what is going to happen to him. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Little side note, another thing these heretics, these non-dispensational liars will do is they'll say well you see they'll, they'll take verses which talk about the prophets prophesying the death and resurrection of jesus christ and they'll say see they're they're saved by the death and resurrection of jesus christ see they're talking about it no they're just prophesying it okay it hadn't been fulfilled yet but continuing verse 32 and he shall be delivered or sorry i think uh yeah uh, prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished, and he shall, verse 32, for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, verse 33, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. So just blatantly telling what's going to happen to him. But look at the response again. Verse 34, and they understood none of these things, and the saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. So again, they didn't understand what was being said. So if it was a belief that the entire Old Testament, that, that they're the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was for salvation, then how come the apostles, who were Jewish, by the way, had no idea what Jesus Christ was saying? They didn't understand it. They were not being saved by looking forward to the cross, unlike this, uh, contrary to what this little liar, this non-dispensational liar, Jack Smack 7, 7, is saying. Christ, and that never changes, and if Jesus Christ is the, the sole means of salvation through the gospel, then why are works added? It makes no sense. So turn over to Hebrews chapter number 4. Now in Hebrews chapter 4, if you back it up to chapter 3, it's, it's dealing with Moses and the, the time of provocation. So obviously this is an Old Testament you know, time period. But in Hebrews chapter 4, it reads in verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto preach, did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So we see right there that in the, in the Old Testament in the epoch, the gospel was preached. And um, unto us, referring to them presently, was the gospel preached. Not in the Old Testament. See how he just twisted it? And if a person does not believe the gospel, it's not going to do anything for them. Uh, what gospel? So let me get this straight. Adam and Eve in the garden. Because, again, what he's saying is that throughout the entire Old Testament, they're being saved by Jesus Christ. So, in other words, Adam and Eve were being saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ way back in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, even though it was thousands of years before it happened. Nutty heresy. So, turn back to Galatians chapter 3. We see this concept again in verse 8. It says, Of course, Galatians 3, 8, typical of all these heretics. I'm going to show you what Galatians 3, 8 is actually saying. Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. Salvation is predicated on being justified by faith. Okay. Because, again, these heretics, they always have to just go to Galatians 3.8. I, I did a video showing how they just totally butcher that verse. Okay. What is Galatians 3.8 saying? Okay. Because he's seen the miss a few things in that verse. And the Scripture, foreseeing. Okay. Foreseeing. Keep that word in mind. That God would justify the heathen through faith. Preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, Okay, what's being said? What's being foreseen? In thee shall all nations be blessed. Okay, it wasn't the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached to Abraham. It was foreseeing. It was a foreshadowing. And what was the foreshadowing? In thee shall all nations be blessed. How, how do you miss that? Because he's lost. That's why. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit inside him. He doesn't have the spirit of truth to guide him into all truth. Okay? What's is, what is Paul quoting in Galatians 3 8? Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Because I just showed you that basically 
the foreshadowing. It wasn't the gospel being preached. It was a foreshadowing, and that foreshadowing was in thee shall all nations be blessed. It wasn't, you know, Jesus Christ died and rose again the third day. First uh, Corinthians fifteen one through four, Genesis chapter twelve verses one to three. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And here we have the foreshadowing, quoting Galatians 3 8. And I will bless him that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay? It was a foreshadowing. It was a foreshadowing. It was not the gospel being preached to Abraham. Okay? I mean, ridiculous. H how do you miss that? Again, he's lost. He, he doesn't, he can't see, he can't understand spiritual things. Um, yeah. Ridiculous. Again, they always had their own in Galatians 3 8, just typical of them. And this was preached to Abraham in the Old Testament times. So this whole theory that salvation came by it wasn't work. Preached, it wasn't the gospel being preached. It was a foreshadowing. How do you miss that? Okay, foreseeing. The gospel was preached to Abraham. Okay, foreseeing. How do you miss that word? Foreseeing. It's a very clear word. And again, I'm being nasty and sarcastic because this little devil here is uh, just, just very, very prideful, very nasty. And with prideful people, you know, you gotta, sometimes you just got to go rough on them. Oops in other dispensations is a bunch of garbage. Now another thing these dispensationalists or these hyper D's are culpable of is trying to say that the epistles of Paul are the only epistles salvifically applicable and that they try to basically teach that the book of John was written for the Jews only. So turn over to John. Now he's partly right there because uh, again he's he's basically describing what a hyper dispensation a hyper dispensationalist is someone who says that you can only go to paul for your doctrine again that's another facet of hyper dispensationalism saying you can only go to paul for your doctrine and nothing else okay no all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for instruction in righteousness uh second timothy 3 16 17. however not all scripture directly applies to the same people at the same time okay uh when it comes to your gospel message okay Yes, the Gospel of John is good, because I do believe the Gospel of John is transitional from the law to grace, under the law to under grace, because you see a lot of stuff in John that mirrors what Paul wrote, okay? But again, uh, Romans 11, 13, and Romans 15, 16, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, okay? So when it comes to your Gospel message, you should primarily be getting your plan of salvation from the Pauline epistles, okay? You can use other verses when it comes to convicting people of their sins, but when it comes to how to be saved, okay? Gospel of John and primarily Pauline epistles. Okay, that's simple. I mean, this is what happens when you don't rightly divide the word of truth. You're a workman that needs to be ashamed. Second Timothy two fifteen. John chapter twenty. Now you'd have to be either unsaved, completely brain dead, demonically possessed, or just flat out stupid to actually teach this. Because why would the book of John be written only for the Jews? When it tells people how to be saved, when people teach this garbage, they're basically intimating that the Jews are the only people that need salvation. So let's take a look at uh, chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31, and it reads, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. That's the purpose of, of the book of John. This book was given... Um, yes. Thank you for just stating a fact. Thank you for just stating what the Bible, what the book of John says. What are you trying to prove? Okay. The book of John, again, is transitional from under the law to under grace. Because a lot of what's in John mirrors the church age. You see, uh, for example, there's plenty of verses in the Gospel of John that prove the biblical doctrine of eternal security. John 6.39, John 5.24, um, I'm trying to think of someone, John 10, uh, 28 and 29. Uh, many scriptures in the Gospel of John prove eternal security. Okay, which is, again, mirrors what Paul wrote. Uh, plenty of verses in the Gospel of John refute work salvation, which, again, lines up what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Titus 3, 5, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 8, 9, many scriptures, Romans 11, 6. So I don't know what he's trying to prove there because it is um, it can't be applied to Christians because it's under it's transitioning from the law to grace. Ridiculous. Even to the unbelievers, okay? The whole point of this is to tell people how to be saved by having faith or believing in the name of Jesus. So anyone who teaches this garbage is a false prophet straight out of hell. Let me go over another verse that makes it very clear that... He's, he's a, a, quote, false prophet straight out of hell. Um, you might want to look at Luke 16, because that's a thing these, these um, people like to do, these easy believers, and people say, oh, he's your, you're a wicked person out of hell. Um, 
hell is not a wicked place. Can never, nowhere in scripture is hell ever uh, associated with with uh, being wicked. Okay, let me show you this. Uh, Luke chapter sixteen, beginning at verse twenty-two. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And look what he says. Look what he's saying here. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in the flame. And you go down there. Uh, he, he talks about the great gulf between Abraham's bosom and uh, hell, which refutes the heresy that, or not the heresy, the false doctrine, okay, that Abraham's bosom e either doesn't exist or it's just a place in heaven. Because I know Stephen Anderson tried to say that, oh, Abraham's bosom is in heaven or something like that. Um, then he, and then the, the uh, rich man says, uh, And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, that lest they also come into this place of torment. Okay? What's going on here? He wakes up, the rich man wakes up in hell, and he's speaking truth. Okay? Nowhere in the Bible are people down in hell, you know, being, you know, saying, oh, I hate God, I, I, I don't believe in God, and that kind of stuff. No. When people are in hell, they understand why they're in hell. They understand that, that they deserve to be in hell, and they understand, basically, that their punishment is just. Truth comes out of hell. Okay? They're speaking truth. Okay? An atheist, when someone, when someone, I'll say it this way, there's not a single atheist in hell. What do I mean by that? Because when you go to hell, you're no longer an atheist. Because at that point, you believe there's a God at that point. You, you understand that there is a God, and you understand that you deserve to be there, and you understand why you're there. Truth comes out of hell. So to say, oh, he's a wicked person, a false prophet, straight out of hell, uh, no. And again, God's the one that runs hell. You know? Ridiculous. I mean, it would make sense if Satan was the one that runs hell. You could say, yeah, he's a false prophet out of hell, but God's the one that created hell and runs hell. So to call somebody, oh, you're wicked as hell, you're you're out, of, you're a false prophet out of hell, not really scripturally accurate because truth comes out of hell. People are speaking truth; they understand the truth when they get to hell, if they're, if they're lost, obviously. Uh, just funny. In the future, in the ages to come, it's still by grace. Turn over to Ephesians. Uh, yes, it's always by grace, but again, grace is not not the plan of salvation. See what he's doing there? He's, he's deceiving his audience. Chapter number two. The real issue is where did this teaching come from? Why turn over to Ephesians chapter number two. The real issue is where did this teaching come from? Why would anyone postulate? And I see what these guys will do is they go with, they always do this, they go with Pauline epistle type stuff, which talk about not being saved by works. And they see, see, it was like that throughout the entire Bible. They're always not saved by works. No. Again, he's not rightly dividing the word of truth. He's a workman that needs to be ashamed, according to 2 Timothy 2.15. Why is my cat meowing? Oh, he wants out of the room. Oh, well. That salvation was completely different in other dispensations. Well, it came from Satan, number one. There's no point in believing this. And the reason why this is so stupid is because... Actually, the only doctrine that came from Satan, um, among many other false doctrines... Sorry about that. Let me just get my alarm. Okay, sorry about that. I had to let my cat out and take the alarm. Do apologize. But as I was saying, the only doctrine that is from Satan regarding dispensationalism is the lie, the satanic lie that they're always saved by faith in every dispensation. Uh, no, you know, salvation is not the same in every dispensation. And anyone who is saying that is a false teacher. If salvation were a combination or if it were like a hybrid grace plus works or faith plus works, then how do you know if you ever attained it? Nobody would have any assurance, and it's just, just a bunch of stupidity. But in, we see in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7, it reads, that in the ages to come, he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. In the ages to come, referring to the future, okay? In the Old Testament, okay, again, the gospel is a mystery. Read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. The gospel was a mystery, wasn't revealed to Paul. In the ages to come. Thank you for proving my point, that, that salvation is not the same in every dispensation. That's through Christ Jesus. So we see right there, in the ages to come, that's future tense, salvation is still by grace. So we need to... Yes, it's always by grace. See, he keeps lying. He keeps saying, oh, it's always by, it's by grace. Yeah, it's always by grace, but grace is not the plan of salvation. 
Okay? And when you're in the time of Jacob's trouble, what do you do with taking the mark of the beast? Okay? Oh, no, no true Christian would take the mark. Uh, it doesn't answer my question. My question was, what if someone does take the mark? My question was not who would take the mark or who wouldn't. That doesn't prove that, that taking the mark doesn't cause you to lose your salvation. Okay? That's what I love about these heretics. We always will say, oh, you know, well, no, no true Christian would take the mark. But, excuse me, my question was, what if somebody does take the mark anyway? Are they still saved? If you say yes, then you're calling God a liar. Because Revelation 14, 9 through 11 is clear that anyone who takes it, not just unsaved people, anyone who takes it, is uh, will end up in the lake of fire. Watch out for these false prophets, these hyper dispensationalists that they may preach grace in this dispensation, but they're still works teachers because they, they want to teach it elsewhere. So let's turn over to one more verse and then I'll close. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 13. It reads in verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. Now if the gospel message... Yeah, that's another little favorite tactic these people like to do. ...is a message about Jesus Christ, as it says in Galatians chapter 1, then the gospel message was the same yesterday, today and forever. They, uh, no, it just says Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, yesterday and today and forever. It does not say the gospel was the same yesterday, yesterday today and forever. See, again, these, they always like the little tactic they like to do. But they'll quote, you know, for example, I think it's, um, let me just go to the verse. They'll quote Hebrews 13.8. They'll quote from Malachi chapter, I think it's 1, I think it's, yeah, 3 and verse 5, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Malachi 3, 6. For I, the Lord, I, ch I am the Lord, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Okay, and they'll say, see, God is always the same. Jesus Christ is always the same. So the gospel has always been the same. You're adding to scripture. You know, condemned in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 to 6. And it doesn't change. And the truth is, is that no matter what dispensation it is, salvation was always by grace. Let's take a look at one more verse. Genesis chapter 6. Let's take a look at verse 8. And it reads, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, the reason why I say that salvation was always by grace... No um... Yeah, again, they're a little funny tactic. Yeah, again, grace is in every dispensation. No, no, like no. I've never heard, I uh, never met a dispensational teacher who denies that grace is in every dispensation. But grace is not the plan of salvation. I keep having to repeat myself because he keeps lying to his audience. No matter what the dispensation is, because human beings, being in their sinful state, can't save themselves. So, if salvation were faith plus works in the Old Testament, and if salvation is going to be faith plus works you know, in the tribulation or whatever, then nobody would be getting saved. Oh, so I guess I can just take the mark and still be saved then. Because that's what it really comes down to, okay? Regardless if you think, oh, no true Christian would take the mark, it doesn't disprove that if somebody takes the mark, they're lost, okay? Again, my question is not, will, will true Christians take the mark or not? My question is, if they do take the mark, are they still saved? They never answer that question. They have to keep avoiding it. Well, it's, well, it's not an option. They won't be able to take it. No. If they take it, are they still saved? That was my question. Oh, ridiculous. Okay. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16 makes it clear that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So you can't teach that salvation was different in different dispensations when it would be impossible. If we had to Again, they, they keep lying. They'll go with Pauline epistle type stuff and they'll apply it to every single dispensation. Um, failure to rightly divide the word of truth again. Do works plus faith it would never be enough. And we'd have the right to boast, so God would not get the... Uh, nobody's, nobody's going to be boasting in heaven, okay? When you're in heaven, you have the mind of Christ. No one's going to be boasting about any, anything. There are common lies, these people like to say. Glory in these other dispensations. So we need to watch out for this false teaching. We need to watch out for the people that promote it. They're a bunch of heretics straight out of hell, and that's where this teaching came from. It's wicked as hell. It's just another... It's, it's wicked as hell. Again, read Luke 16, 22 to 26. Truth comes out of hell. There's no, the, hell is not, okay, nowhere in Bibles, in scripture, is hell ever called a wicked place. No, no, it's wicked as hell. Show me one verse where hell is called wicked. Just weird. Form of work salvation, thinly veiled. That's all I have. Let me go ahead and close in prayer. Okay, enough of that little heretic. I'm going to show you from the word of God, verses that this little liar would not show you. And anyone who does teach that, oh, salvation has always been the same, here are verses that they will not show you. Or they'll try to wriggle the way around it somehow. Ezekiel, here's a really good one to refute these, these heretics. Ezekiel chapter 3, verses beginning at verse 18 to verse 21. Here, and here's a really good one to use against these little heretics. 
uh, like I said earlier, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Verse 19, Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. Hmm. Interesting how Jack Smack 7 7 is so militantly against turning from sin to be saved, and says that works. But verse 19, if the wicked turn not from his wickedness, he what's the result? He dies in his iniquity. So, what do you have there? Works. You're having to turn from your sin. Okay, again, turning from sin is works. Jonah 3.10. You read Jonah 3.10, God saw their works. What were their works? That they turned from their evil way. Ezekiel 3.19. If he turn not from his wickedness, nor his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. So they say by faith? I don't think so. Verse 20. Here's a really good one. Ezekiel 3.20, uh, down to, yeah, is it, I'll just, yeah, verse 20, I'll put it that way. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, die in his sin, I'll say it again one more time for these heretics, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. So you have a righteous man turning from his righteousness, and he dies in his sin as a result. What does it mean to die in your sin? You go to hell. A righteous man here. So, what do you do with that? Oh, it's it just talking about physical death. Just physical death. Uh, excuse me, it says die in your sin. It doesn't talk anything about physical death. It's talking about a righteous man losing his salvation. Oops. And dying in his sin. What, how do you get around that? Again, Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 18 down to verse 21. I'll read verse 21. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous, and the righteous that the righteous sin not, he doth not sin, he shall, he shall surely live, because that he is warned, and thou hast delivered thy soul. So you're having the, sorry, and also thou hast delivered thy soul. So you're having to warn the righteous to turn from sin to deliver your own soul. Again, that's Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. Go look it up. It refutes the whole heresy that salvation has always been the same in every dispensation. Here's another good one. Ezekiel chapter 4. Verse number 14, because notice how he said, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 4, verse number 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should, that, sorry, they should deliver their own souls, deliver their own souls, look at this, by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. So let's say it by faith? Um, I don't think so. They're delivering their souls by their righteousness. Okay, compare this over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verses 24 and 25. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. Look at verse 25. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these things, all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. Our righteousness. Uh, I don't think they're being saved by faith. It doesn't look like that. Unless you're a lost, hell blown heretic like Jack Smack 7-7, seven, seven, who has no understanding of the word of God. Another good one, Ezekiel chapter 18. And there's so many verses I can go through, just, just a couple of them. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 24 to, to uh, 27, uh, which is mirroring what Ezekiel 3, verses 18 through 21 says. Uh, Ezekiel 18, 24. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations, sorry, that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteous, righteousness that he hath done... You know, Deuteronomy 6.25, it shall be our righteousness. Shall not be shall, shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he has trespassed, and in his sin that he has sinned, in them shall he die. So again, a righteous man turning from his righteousness and committing iniquity, and he's dying in his sin as a result. You know, John chapter 8, verse 24, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sin. What does it mean? That, again, what does it mean to die in your sin? You go to hell. A righteous man here. Uh, verse 25, Yet ye say, The way of the Lord is not equal. Here now, O Israel, or house of Israel, is is not my, my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? Not good at reading on a computer. Verse 26, When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. So again, you have someone dying in his iniquity. Here's a really good one. To refute the whole, people will say, Oh, this is about physical salvation. Okay, answer this then. The whole fending right heretics. Uh, Ezekiel 18, 27. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth 
that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. So he's saving his soul, not physical salvation. He's saving his soul because he's turning from his wickedness. They're not being saved by faith, by grace through faith alone in every dispensation. Uh, a couple more scriptures I'm going to cover. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 8 to 9. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood of lie require at thine hand. So again, a wicked man who doesn't turn from his wickedness, he dies in his sin. Where is the mention of Jesus Christ dying for his sins? It's not. Verse 9, Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked from his, from his way, to turn from it, and if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So again, he has to turn from his wicked way, to, uh, or else he would die in his iniquity, and, but look at this, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So you're delivering your soul because you're warning the wicked. Sorry, I just had to, my cat came in. I do apologize, I keep having all these different uh, interruptions. Anyway. Um, yeah, just going to cover a couple more scriptures, then I will close this video. It's getting pretty long. Uh, oh, what was I, I going to cover? Oh, yeah, uh, Leviticus chapter uh, 16. Uh, where is it at? I'm trying to remember, I think it's somewhere in verse, somewhere in chapter 16. Let me just try to find it. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh... I mean, really, the whole chapter of, of Leviticus 16 proves that the animal sacrifices were part of the atonement. In fact, most of the words, references to the word, to the word atonement in the Bible are in the Old Testament. In fact, there's only one time the word atonement is used in the New Testament. It's in Romans chapter 5. Uh, the rest of the times the word atonement is used in the Old Testament, or is it, the rest of the time the word atonement is used in the Bible, are in the Old Testament, and a lot of them are referenced to animal sacrifices. They were an atonement. They weren't just symbolic, as some people, will some heretics will try to teach. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, where is it? I'm trying to find it. It's I can't remember exactly where it is. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just read. I'll, I might have to just read the whole chapter. Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, here it is. Yeah, uh, Leviticus chapter sixteen, verse number sixteen. And he shall make an atonement for their for the holy place because of the unclean all because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. So and so that he shall do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of the unclean of their uncleanness. So what are the animal sacrifices for? An atonement for their sins. Interesting. And really, you can read the whole chapter. It's just atonement, 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 atonement. The animal sacrifices were an atonement. They were not just symbolic or whatever for uh, for the for the sins of the children of Israel, for, for a sin they would committed. And anyone who is teaching that is a flat-out heretic. Uh, yeah. I think, I, I think that's the verse. Sorry, no, no, it was verse 34. That was the verse I was looking for. Verse 16 and verse 34. And this shall be done, shall be an everlasting statue unto you, to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year, as he as he did as the Lord commanded Moses. So again, they were an atonement for sins. They were not just symbolic, the animal sacrifices. And you can read so many chapters, Leviticus five, Leviticus four. Um, so many chapters prove that the animal sacrifices were an atonement for sins. Go look it up. Leviticus five, Leviticus four, Leviticus sixteen. Ridiculous. So I'm gonna close this video off finally. Just showing you that salvation has not been the same in every dispensation. And anyone who is teaching that is a heretic. And again, what do you do at the time of Jacob's trouble? You know, uh, Revelation 7.14 says that they're washing their own robes. Okay? We don't have to wash our own robes. We're washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6.11. 6, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, Revelation 7.14, they're having to wash their own robes. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1-5. to 5, They have to do works so they're not blotted out of the book of life. 
again, Revelation 14, 9 through 11. They have to, they, they can't take the mark of the beast. Uh, just so many scriptures. And again, read Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Go read that chapter, the judgment at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. And notice how when Jesus judges them, he doesn't mention anything about faith. It's all works. They're all being judged by their works at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. So anyone who's teaching that salvation is the same in every dispensation is a heretic and a false teacher, just like Jack Smack 7-7. So don't be deceived by this little liar, Jack Smack 7-7. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye. Thank you.